So welcome to the International Accounting Standards number 36, Impairment of Asset. So uh, we've talked about a lot of asset uh, impairments uh, in the previous sections. For example, we've talked about the inventories impairment and that shouldn't be accounted for under the IS number 36 because the inventory impairment should be accounted for under the IS number 2 inventories. So that means the IS number 36 uh, may not be suitable to certain circumstances. So, for example, we've talked about inventories. We've, for example, it's the contract asset under the IFRS 15 revenue, deferred tax asset related to the future um, tax benefits that we can receive, the pension asset, financial asset, investment property, biological asset, and these uh, assets uh, will not be covered in this standard, okay, IS number 36. So the basic rule about the impairment of asset is with relates to primarily the property plant equipment and also intangible asset, uh, goodwill, and also non current asset held for sale. So according to the rule in the IS number 36, we should compare the carrying value of that particular asset, which means the cost minus accumulated depreciation or amortization, uh, with its recoverable amount. Okay? So what do I mean by recoverable amount? Is whether we can recover the initial cost in the first place. And that means whether you, whether you can reclaim your money back or not. So this is based on the concept of uh, for example, the carrying value is the historical costs, but recoverable amount, we are looking at, in particular, the current value. According to the relevance concepts in the conceptual framework, what that means is, from a business point of view, it may have to decide whether we're going to be using this asset in our business in the long term, and generate future economic benefit in, and this is commonly known as VIU, or value in use. But perhaps the business may not use this asset anymore in the near future. The business may decide to sell it. If the business decides to sell it, what will be the fair value of the market price that it can obtain if the asset is sold in the marketplace? But we are talking about the net uh, benefit um, in your hand and that means we need to subtract the cost of disposal which means the net proceeds that you can have from selling this asset. So think about it this way, if the asset carried in your statement of financial position at $100, if you decide to use this asset in the longer term, the value in use is 70. While it's the fair value minus cost of disposal, if you decide to sell it, you can obtain $80 of the benefit. And if that's the case, the recoverable amount, in this case, we're going to be choosing $80 instead of 70. Because by doing that, as you can see, from the business point of view, it makes its best decision uh, from the numbers point of view. And that's why we call it the higher of the value in use and, and fair value less cost of disposal to determine the recoverable amount. In this case, it carries at 100. That means from a cost point of view, under the going concern assumption in the conceptual framework requirement, we should at least recover $100 cost back because we've spend the money buying the property plant equipment or intangibles and it carried at $100 right now. We should have recovered this $100 back. But now we can see we can only recognize or we can only recover $80 that we estimate. And if that's the case, there should be an impairment loss worth of 20 because 100 minus 80. So that's the basic rule about the uh, impairment of asset. Very, very important concept that we have to bear in mind. And we talked about that later on when we come to it. No worries for that. And 
Once we've looked at the rule of impairment, the next thing we'll be covering is how we're going to, det how we're going to be determining the VIU or value in use. So in particular, we'll be looking at things that can be included and cannot be included uh, in calculating the present value of the future cash flows from generating from this asset if we were to use it in the longer term. And once we've done that, we'll be looking at the fair value or FVE less cost of disposal, which means the net proceeds to your business. And in particular, we'll be discussing how we're going to determine the fair value, how we're going to determine the uh, cost of disposal. And in particular, we'll be looking at a very specific area, is the removal cost of how we're going to calculate that, uh, account for that as well in the, in the financial statement. And of course, if there are impairment indicators indicate, in, in indicating uh, that the asset may be impaired, we need to perform the impairment review test. So the impairment review test is what we've looked at before, is where we compare the current value of the non current asset with its recoverable amount. If the current value is more than its recoverable amount, the impairment occurs, but vice versa, no impairment needed, no journal entries needed. And once we look at the uh, indicators, the next thing, because we are looking at things from a single asset's point of view, but in some circumstances, that the assets may be grouped together and become a cash generating unit or we can call it as the CGU. So, related to CGU, how are we going to perform the impairments related to CGU uh, and uh, some sort of examples uh, of CGU as well. And finally, can impairments be reversed? Yes, it can. Uh, we've talked about the rules for impairment reversal as well, and quite an interesting and complicated rule uh, we're looking at later on. Let's get started. So the first thing we've talked about is the rule of the uh, impairment of non-current asset is where we're going to compare the carrying value, which means the cost minus accumulated depreciation or amortization with the recoverable amount. So as we mentioned before, uh, according to the conceptual framework requirements, the values that we can use, that means the current value, is related to the historical costs. So historical costs, we carry out these costs because under the going concern assumption, okay, in the conceptual framework, we should be able to operate our business for at least 12 months from the current financial financial statement reporting period and uh, we carry out this cost because we assume that we can recover this money back. The recoverable amount on the other hand based on the conceptual framework requirement I mean is using the current value. Okay. And in particular we are looking at things from relevance point of view uh, and, and that means according to the qualitative characteristic I mean the carrying value stands for faithful representation because it can be traced back from the invoices and contracts or past records but um, According to a concept in the conceptual framework called prudence, we're going to be seeing whether the current value is more than its recoverable amount. The recoverable amount, of course, we're going to be choosing the higher of these two figures, for example, the value in use, or VIU. And this talks about the present value of the future cash flows. And that means if you were to receive a hundred dollars from uh, uh, using this asset in a longer period of time, you're going to be discounted back 
using a pulpit discount factor to calculate the value in use, or I can call it as the VIU for short. Or the fair value minus cost of disposal. So here's the thing. So suppose, in a previous example, that we talked about the carry value being 100, the value in use being 80, and 70 for the fair value less cost of disposal. And here, the recoverable amount should be 80. But does that 80 actually means that the asset should be used in a business or should be sold? Well, the answer is um, not a problem for that because we're not talking about we should use this asset or we should sell this asset, but just standing from the value or figures point of view, how are we going to determine whether the asset carrying value can be recovered or not? And of course, the management may have its intention to sell it at a discount, or perhaps uh, the government uh, may not permit the business to operate in this particular country, and that's why the value in use value would be quite low. Uh, but it, it does not really mean that the business uh, should use or should sell this asset, but just to test whether the asset is being paired or not. In this case, because the carrying value is 100 and recoverable amount is 80, the carrying volume is more than its recoverable amount. And in essence, 100 minus 80, that would be $20. We should recognize the impairment loss expense by debiting the impairment loss in the statement of profit or loss by the difference of $20 and to credit, that means the asset at carrying value worth of $20. Okay? So one is putting in the PL statement of profit or loss as reduction in profit, and one putting it in the SFP statement of financial position using the asset value. Okay, so that's how we do it. So let me change the scenario a little bit further. If I were to say that the historical cost is 100, but now value in use is 180, and if that's the case, the recoverable amount is 180. So in this case, the current value is less than the recoverable amount. Should we recognize a gain related to that $80 as the revaluation surplus, something like that? No, you can't. Okay? So what that means is, if the carrying value, or we use CB, is less or equals to recoverable amount, so that means no journal entries will be needed. Well, the simple idea is this. We are talking about the financial statement should be prepared under the going concern assumption, and it is reasonable and normal that the carrying value is less than its recoverable amount. It's absolutely normal for that to happen because we aim to make a profit in the longer period of time. And that means no general entry is needed if the recoverable amount is higher than its carrying value because we assume that we can recover all of our investment back. Okay? Uh, if this is the case. So no gains should be recognised. And of course, we've talked about the impairment reversal later on when we come to it. So once we've understood the rule behind the impairment, the next thing is where we're going to be discussing about the recoverable amount. In particular, first of all, it's the value in use, or VIU, and what sort of things will be included in the VIU. Well, we've talked about the cash flows can be included. Cash flows do not need to be included okay, in the VIU calculation. The simple idea is this. We assume that in the future we can receive $1,000, suppose, and continue to use it. We can receive $1,000 in, for example, one year's time. And the discount rate, let's say 10% of the incremental borrowing rate, or we can call it as the interest rate, for power of 1. So that's how we calculate the present value 
of the future cash flows discounted back <coughs> at today's uh, discount rate. So the question is how are we going to determine that $1,000 to be included in our calculation? How are we going to be determining what discount rates that we should use in discounting those future cash flows into today's terms? And that's what we're looking at the value in use calculation here. So first of all, it would include the normal things. Okay? So in relation to the necessary inflows and outflows, that's quite important indeed. So suppose that we are using this particular uh, piece of plant equipment to produce a specialised items and um, during the uh, current economic condition and our current marketing plan and also production plan, we aim to produce uh, a thousand units product to be sold in the market. And according to our current estimate, based on a past record, we received, for example, $2 million of the cash inflows. And that $2 million of cash inflows should be used as a basis to determine what will be the future cash inflows to the business when we are calculating the uh, value in use. And this is what I mean by necessary inflows. And you can't simply overstate that inflows. I know lots of businesses may try to do that, but this is not allowed. So for example, so the business may think that we can use the same piece of equipment and to produce one million items, but it is a lot over its capacity or the current capacity or the maximum capacity. And if that's the case, that the inflows, for example, taking the estimated uh, products to be produced and sold and times by the current market price to calculate the current inflows do not make any sense at all. So that's why we have to use the necessary inflows. Same for outflows, for example, the costs. Have you ever signed a contract with the supplier? Uh, for example, you may have to pay the maintenance costs, insurance expenses. Well, these costs need to be included in calculating the value in use. But for any costs that are not an obligation to our business, and you may decide to improve your uh, piece of equipment's performance in the future. For example, you may decide to spend two million, two billion in uh, two years time. Is this allowed? No, because if the cost is not obligated, or if the costs are not committed, Committed means, which means, have you ever put it into a plan? For example, discuss it in your uh, board meeting, um, putting a budget on that, and you decide to do it. If this is not the case, regarding the inflows and outflows, this cannot be included uh, in the numerator in your calculation of your VIU value in use. Okay. So, as I said, we can base our calculation on our current necessary inflows and outflows. Uh, do we have to include inflation or not? Well, the answer is it really depends. You can use it or you don't have to use it. But if you decide to use it, um, please use it consistently. And according to a conceptual framework requirement, and this is according to the comparability. principle. Okay. Related to the asset, when we purchase the asset or asset the reporting period, we may estimate what would be the scrap value would be, which means at the end of the useful life of the equipment, for example, we may decide to sell it uh, at a discount 
And at the time that we purchase it, or perhaps at the end of the reporting period, if the scrap value is significant, we have to take them into account in calculating the depreciation expenses. And uh, the scrap value should be included in your calculation of the VIU, value in use. And of course, when scrap value is significant, we have to take them into account. And this is according to the materiality principle or concept according to the conceptual framework. So any sort of items that cannot be included in your VIU calculation will include things like your financing activity. And this is quite important indeed. Because we are saying that first of all, we are discounting those future cash flows, and that means the discount rate have automatically included the finance cost in our business and you shouldn't double count for that. And second, any financing activity is not an obligated cash flows to our business because you can decide to uh, issue your additional shares or perhaps taking out additional loans from the bank in the future. It is not an obligation, it's not a must do option to our business, it's not an uh, obligation to our business at all is just to be a choice to a business and if that's the case the financing activities cannot be included in the VIU calculation and finally the tax cannot be included simply because the future tax laws may change so that's why when we are discounting the uh, future cash flows which means the discount rates that we should use in our calculation, in the denominator in our calculation, should reflect, first of all, it should be the incremental borrowing rate for the similar asset. And this is a very important concept. So, for example, you've got an apartment in your business, you may go to a bank and say, well, what is the incremental borrowing rate? I mean, the bank may uh, check similar apartment around your area if anyone has taken out a loan before and then the bank may calculate uh, or give you directly the rate that may be applicable to the similar apartment that someone taking out a loan for that and you can use that rate to discount your future cash flows and this is commonly known as the incremental borrowing rate and it's different from the general interest rate, to be perfectly honest, because if you're taking out a loan for a particular asset, for the asset one, for the asset two, the finance cost of the interest expense may not be the same. And that's why we should use the incremental borrowing rate for the particular asset, okay, um, if we were to calculate the present value of the VIU, or the present value of the future cash flows to become the value in use value. But alternatively, the ICE number 36 says you do not have to use the incremental borrowing rate, but you can use the weighted average cost of capital in your business, or the WAC, if you like, which means considering the weighted average of your debt and equity finance in your business uh, to be used as the discount rate. So it's, it's entirely up to you, it's your choice, it's your accounting policy, no problem for that. But either rate, you should use a pre-tax rate. Do you know why? For the, simple reason, the simple reason being, we should exclude the tax effect from the calculation of the uh, VIU, because tax law may change in the future. And that's why we shouldn't consider the tax consequences. And that means the pre-tax effect should be included. So once we've understood the value in use calculations, the, the, the next element is the fair value, or FV minus cost of disposal. You may have seen this concept before. Maybe look at the net realizable value calculation in the ICE number two. And these concepts are quite similar to each other. But we are talking about the, uh, the non-current asset 
in the ICE number 36 impairment. And that's why we should use the, the, the name of cost of disposal rather than uh, simply be the estimated cost to sell and to complete the asset because now we are looking at if the uh, piece of equipment is going to be uh, removed from our business and what sort of significant disposal costs to, that we may have to incur uh, compared to the inventory. I mean, where we've talked about the cost to complete and cost to sell to determine the, uh, the, the net realizable value. And, and very similar concept, but we are using it in different standards. So first of all, we've talked about the fair value calculation. Um, interestingly, this should be accounted for under the IFAS number 13, fair value measurement. Okay, to determine the uh, fair value. Uh, in the IFAS number, number 13, it says, it really depends on whether there will be an active market or not. Okay, so there will be active market or no active market. to determine the, uh, the fair value. So what I mean by fair value is this. If you have been trading shares, for example, buying and selling shares in your uh, software, in your mobile phone, you may have seen a concept called exit price. And this means if you decide to sell your shares and somebody will be buying your shares instantly once you've quote a price and then sell your shares. And that price that you've sold where other parties are buying and this price is called the exit price. And this price is also referred to as the fair value. And that's why, for example, if you see the shares quote uh, from the stock exchange, you can see the fair value fluctuates each and every second, perhaps, or each every minute. It really depends on which jurisdictions you're in. And that price reflects fair price. Because it's the exit price, if you decide to sell it, of course, somebody will be buying it. So, if we are saying that the active market exists, and that means there'll be huge amounts of volumes of transactions uh, taking place each and every day or seconds or minutes, I don't know, but it's quite active. And in this case, when determining the fair value, should you use a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars, it really depends on the same asset in the market or the price from the similar asset in the active market. Um, this is referred to as the level one input, level two input. And that means, should you use a hundred or thousand dollars? Well, if you are selling the same item, theoretically, we should use the same asset price. For example, we're selling the same item, so same item will be sold a thousand dollars, a thousand dollars will be the fair value. But if you're selling properties, on the other hand, it's quite difficult for you to use the level one input, to be perfectly honest, according to my observation, because each apartment or each uh, building will be located in different area. And that's why we may choose a similar asset. The price for the similar asset, yes, we can use it as the fair value with uh, minor modifications or adjustments for that. So, for example, adjusting for 20% off discount if you're not located, if the building is not located in a good area, and something like that. And of course, if there's no active market, we should use the level 3 input, which means we should use the estimate from the management to determine the value of this particular asset. And in this case, according to IFRS number 13, Normally, we should use the present value of the future cash flows according to your cash budget. 
So these are how we determine the fair value according to IFRS number 13. But to be perfectly honest, when we are determining the fair value of the piece of equipment, very simply, we look up in the, in, in the, uh, in the, in the secondary market and to see whether or not there will be second-hand or similar uh, brand new asset and what will be the value of those assets to be used uh, to determine its fair value. No problem for that whatsoever. And we have to consider how we're going to determine the cost of disposal as well. Okay? Cost of disposal, first of all, it should be directly related to the particular non current asset uh, that you're talking about. So this is a very, very important concept. Okay? You can't say uh, that I'm going to dispose of the non current asset number one, and can we include the cost of disposal of the non current asset number two in the calculation of the non current asset number one? No, you can't. Okay? The cost of disposal should be directly related to the non current asset you're going to dispose of. And of course, for comparative purposes, we should also exclude any uh, finance costs and also tax expenses because in the calculation of the VIU value in use we exclude those items and that's why in the uh, fair value less cost of disposal calculation we should also exclude those items as well. A very specific area relating to the uh, fair value minus cost of disposal is the concept of removal costs. So removal costs, for example, for some of the industries, mining and oil industries, you may have to uh, remove the mine or remove the oil rig at the end of its useful life according to the environmental law in your jurisdiction. And that's why how we're going to account for the removal costs quite important in that. And of course, according to IS number 36, impairment of asset, there'll be two ways that we can uh, account for the removal cost here. So, let me just to give you a simple example just for fun. We've got the carrying value of the property plant equipment and the recoverable amount. So, for example, here, uh, when we are determining the recoverable amount, it should be the higher of value in use and fair value minus cost of disposal. So here, we've talked about the carrying value being uh, $100. The value in use, 60. The fair value, 80. Here, we've talked about the removal cost being $10 here. Um, yeah, initially it should be accounted for in the cost of disposal. And here, I'm going to use another color. The option number one of how we're going to treat that removal cost is we're going to include that $10 in a fair value minus cost of disposal, which means the cost of disposal calculation. In this case, as you can see, the fair value minus cost of disposal worth of 70 is higher than the VIU and that should be the recoverable amount. And the carrying value is $100 and the difference of $30 here we should account for as the impairment expense. And that's how we do it. And this is the option one. For some businesses they may use another option to say right I'm not going to account for the uh, co uh, removal cost uh, in the recoverable amount calculation, but uh, I'm going to account for the removal cost in the carrying value, which means it becomes 110 because we plot 10 of the removal costs in the carrying value. And in this case, we shouldn't double count the removal cost of $10 in the recoverable amount. And in this case, as we see, the recoverable amount will be 80.
but not considering the removal costs in calculating the fair value minus cost of disposal. And here we've used 110 minus 80, and that will certainly become 30, okay? which is the same figure as before. So as you can see, the impairment losses under these two, op these two options are just to be a same worth of 30. It really depends on your accounting policy, how you're going to account for the removal costs, either in the current value or in the fair value minus cost of disposal. It's entirely up to you. It's your choice. Um, there's a similar example in your book as well. Um, I'm going to leave you to sales study for that question, very similar to this one. Uh, you can read that question and do it on your own. Um, once we've looked at the uh, value in use and fair value minus cost of disposal calculation, the next thing is going to be focusing on the impairment indicators. I mean, according to a conceptual framework, it has a concept called prudence. Very, very important concept. The prudence means, according to a conceptual framework, you cannot understate your expense or liability and you cannot overstate your income and asset. And in this case, you really cannot understate your expense, you can't overstate your asset. And that's why according to the prudence concept, if there are impairment indicators exist, you have to do a perform an impairment review test by the finance department. And how can this be done in a real business is where the finance department staff will be communicating with lots of other departments in the business uh, to see how we're going to determine the price that we're going to sell the asset uh, or perhaps uh, the value in use calculation by, uh, by looking at, for example, the production department data, including the uh, machine capacity uh, and also the estimated selling price uh, and also cost for producing those uh, products as well. So the impairment review test is where we compare the current value with its recoverable amount that we've just seen before. But here we are talking about the impairment indicators. So the indicators can be internal indicators or it can be external indicators. So what do I mean by internal indicators are the indicators took place inside the business, we did it, in other words. External indicators took place outside the business, in other words, we did not do it, somebody else did it. So internal indicators, examples could be subject to physical damage, the asset, the, 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 the asset has been damaged, for example, Or perhaps the asset has been put either use, okay? Nobody else would like to use it or for temporary reasons, something like that. Or perhaps for intangible assets, that the useful life of the intangible asset from indefinite to finite life. or perhaps according to the cash budget, the actual cash flows from operating this asset are worse than this budget. And that's why um, we're going to be performing the impairment review, review test to see if there are any impairment expenses that we should recognise External impairment indicator could be, for example, changes 
in macro environment factors. So, for example, typical example would be an increase in interest rates will certainly drag down the price of our properties. And if that's the case, the, the, the property was subject to be um, uh, an impairment review test to see whether its value actually goes down. Or perhaps in some circumstances, the change in cost estimate. So, for example, initially we decide to do these things or use this equipment in house. But now, if we were to outsource it to somebody else, perhaps uh, we can enjoy uh, more economic uh, benefit into our business if we were to use the outsourcing option. If we were to use the outsourcing option, perhaps we're going to put the machine idle, uh, not into use, and that would be subject to um, an impairment review test if there's a change in cost estimate from bringing this in-house, which means we do it on our own, to the outsourcing option. Um, another example uh, of the external indicator is where the current value of our equity, which means the asset minus our liability, is more than its market value. And is that, if that's the case, that means that the market participants or the investors are not paying sufficiently uh, high price to purchase your shares because your current value is greater than the market value. And that would be an impairment indicator to suggest that the asset value needs to be dragged down okay, a little bit further because it should be uh, based on the current value or the market value if you like. So these are the impairment indicators and I hope you're absolutely happy. And of course, uh, there will be certain uh, different impairment indicators for certain industries. For example, in car industries, for example, the product recalls uh, would be an impairment indicator. And for some of the financial services industries, the increase in bad debt levels uh, would be an impairment indicator for the property industries. Uh, the increase in interest rate would certainly be an impairment indicator. So, if there's an impairment indicator, what you have to do is to perform the impairment review tests to compare the current value with the recallable amount to recognise any associated impairment loss expenses, and that's quite important. Um, in these sections that we've talked about, the rule value in use, fair value, less cost of disposal, and also the impairment indicator. Um, I'm sure that you're absolutely happy with that. Um, in the next section onwards, we'll be talking about the cash generating unit, and also the rule for impairment reversal rule. Okay? Um, very, very interesting section as well. And I look forward to seeing you in our next video. Bye. APC, accounting for your future.